So good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Trogdon, and I am the Chief of Public Transportation with DRPT. And um, I'm sure that on this call, there, on this webinar, there's many current uh, past and future friends and colleagues. And so, so it's great to be with you today on this beautiful day in the Old Dominion. Um, I believe we have over 100 people on this webinar that are representing agencies from across the Commonwealth. So thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, if you're on this webinar, it means that your organization uh, was awarded some funding from one or more of DP DRPT's public transportation programs. Um, if that doesn't describe why you're here, I'd be interested to know how in the heck you got here, but um, we could talk about that later, maybe. Um, the presentation uh, given by our staff today will provide information on what you can expect in the administration of the funding award. Um, one theme that I will state up front is for you, to, for you all to keep an open line of communication with your transit program manager or transit planner as your primary contact. Um, if they don't have the answer right away, they will find the information for you in a timely manner and um, get back to you um, with, with any help that you need. Um, also, uh, I'd just like to say that just as many of the organizations that you all work for, uh, DRPT does have some new staff as well as vacancies in a number of positions. And so in some areas, we're, we're working on getting back up to speed on, on a few things. So um, please know that uh, DRPT is invested in your success and that keeping um, that open line of communication with your program manager or your planner is key. So um, with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to our staff who will introduce themselves and provide a few housekeeping um, items and some rules of engagement for the webinar today. Um, but thank you again for joining us and um, have a great day. Thank you. Right. Well, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you for those words, Zach. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, as Zach said, my name is Avery Darty, and I'm a, a statewide programs manager here with DRPT in the Richmond office. Uh, before we begin, just wanted to let you know that this webinar was specifically designed for Virginia's public transit agencies and planning organizations. Uh, for clarification on any of the specific program detail covered in today's webinar, we encourage you to reach out, as Zach said, to your DRPT program manager. All right, next slide. And just a few housekeeping notes. All participants will remain in listen-only mode. Uh, we have dedicated some time for questions throughout this presentation and at the end of this morning's presentation. Uh, to ask questions, just utilize the raise hand function located on the upper right side of your window. And our DRPT moderator, Mary Olivia, will recognize you and unmute your microphone. You can also submit questions utilizing the chat function. And DRPT will post this webinar recording on our YouTube uh, page. Okay, so today we have included three reference documents for the webinar. First is going to be the slide deck of the presentation. The second is the purple book, which is the grant administration procedures. Uh, this provides you with all the information on how to manage your grants after you have received the award. And lastly, the Blue Book, which is the Grant Applications Manual, uh, which will be revised this fall ahead of the fiscal year 25 grant application cycle. This will prove to be very helpful as you apply for fiscal year 25 grants. And I also want to make sure to point out that the Purple Book and Blue Book are also available on Olga on the News and Information page. All right, and here's a look at today's agenda. We will start things off with grant administration. Next, move into asset management, followed by commuter assistance program performance data. Then we will get into transit strategic plan, and that will be then followed by something new for this year, which is a pre-application requirement for major expansion capital construction projects, followed by procurement updates, communication updates, and engineering updates. And then we will conclude today's presentation with a wrap up and next steps. Okay. And so without further ado, let's get into grants administration. 
In this section, we will cover the different things you can do in Olga, such as canceling or reducing open projects, reimbursement, time extensions, budget and scope changes, and closing out grants and deobligations. Next slide. Okay, so for grants excuse me, grants management, we utilize a grants management and administration tool called Olga, which stands for Online Grants Administration. It is through Olga that you can change master users in the system, perform contract administration tasks like signing state master agreement, cancel projects, reduce open projects, which are those projects that are considered unexecuted, submit reimbursement requests, extension requests if you need additional time on a project and have sufficient explanation as to why the project needs extending. And just a note with that, remember you're only granted one extension request on projects, so please make sure that the revised end date of the request provides ample and sufficient time to have remaining invoices submitted and the work to be completed for the project. Lastly, Olga is also the place to close out projects and to deobligate grants. Please note that if you're changing an Olga master user, you must sign a new contract and agree or agreement. In our next slide, we'll get into this a little bit more. Okay, every Olga account must have what's called a master user. When making a change to the master user, a new Olga contract must be signed. All master users need to go in and check to make sure that contacts are updated and that you've deactivated those uh, contacts that are no longer with your organization. Uh, please review all the users and make sure that this contact information has been updated. Every master user needs to also assign at minimum one additional user in the system. And another note, um, no user is permitted to use another's login credentials. Okay, and the next uh, uh, portion of this presentation will discuss canceling or reducing open projects. All right, for this year, and, and before, we have improved Olga to allow you to cancel a contract prior to its execution or before the contract has been signed. There are times when a project needs to be canceled before it begins. So if that's the case, there's now a feature in Olga to do this. This feature is called Cancel or Reduce Open Project. This should only be done or used if you're planning to not, or if you're not planning, excuse me, to move forward with a certain project. This allows you to cancel, deobligate it, and close it, and also gives you the ability to reduce the project budget if needed. We will talk more about scope changes and budget increases, as well as the obligations and closures of executed projects later in this presentation. All right, now we will get into grant reimbursements for awarded projects. A reminder that you can only submit one reimbursement request per project per month, and that these reimbursement requests should be submitted at least on a quarterly basis. We ask that you help us to help you with timely reimbursements by making sure that you've submitted a summary sheet listing each expense. Otherwise, your request could be denied and we'll, you'll need to resubmit it. Next slide, please. Okay, the very first thing that should be in your supporting documentation that you submit to us, as mentioned in the previous slide, is a summary page. This is very crucial that the order to which the supporting documentation uh, matches that of the, of the summary page. Uh, therefore, please ensure that these supporting documents are arranged and numbered in the same order as the summary page to ensure clarity. Uh, important to point out here, in the case that only a portion of an invoice is being charged to a particular project for reimbursement, we do ask that you please note the amount that is being charged and also give us an explanation. Please make sure to include all documents from contractors invoices. For commuter assistance program grant reimbursements, you must include a document that illustrates the work uh, performed by each staff person being charged to the grant. Uh, please refer to the DRPT Purple Book for additional information on supporting documentation. For 5311 and commuter assistance grantees, please include indirect costs as a line item budget category in your application and cap grant agreement. Recipients receiving these funds must prepare a cost allocation plan that shows the calculation of an indirect cost rate. Recipients need to provide this indirect cost rate approval letter from BDOT or corresponding federal agency. So in order to receive these funds, your agency must prepare an indirect cost rate proposal or use a maximum rate of 
CAP grantees also need to illustrate how the indirect cost charge was calculated on the reimbursement request. Again, please refer to your uh, DRPT program manager or the Purple Book for more detail. With reimbursements regarding travel, we must follow the Commonwealth of Virginia regulation, so the General Services Administration, GSA, and its Internal Re Revenue Service, IRS rates, rules, and regulations. This applies to both yourself and your contractors. Documentation you will need to submit with yours or your contractor's reimbursement request for travel include travel summary sheets, hotel, excuse me, hotel receipts, meals, uh, per diem recommended and GSA per diem rate supply here, receipts for car rentals, ride hailing, parking, tolls, et cetera, and also a final program for conferences that shows what meals, if any, were provided. For commuter assistance recipients here, uh, commuter assistance program recipients, you'll need to have your DRPC program manager look over your travel plans prior to booking your hotel or other travel-related arrangement. And of note, you may only travel if it is noted in your grant contract appendix and may not go over the travel education and training line item amount budgeted. Let's get into time extensions for awarded projects. It is a requirement that time extensions be submitted a minimum of 30 days before the end date of the project. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, any extension request fewer than 30 days of the project expiration may be denied or risk the grant being closed before an extension can be processed administratively. So, very important to stay on top of these. Although it is encouraged not to wait to ask for an extension request for projects, there are some limits. We ask you to engage in conversations with your program managers with projects that have encountered some challenges along the way so that you can point it out, uh, put it on your DRPT program manager's radars uh, that you will be coming in for a time extension within a reasonable time frame. A reminder, you are only permitted one time extension per project and that extensions may only be granted for a maximum of a 12 year period, 12 months, excuse me, period of time. We ask for an explanation detailing the need of, for the extension, provide a new project schedule, as well as update the project milestone. Please note that the commuter assistance program operating grant cannot be extended. Okay, now moving into budget and scope changes. Again, with this, it is important to engage in conversations early with your program managers with changes uh, before you send in your request. The proper form must be completed in order to submit a budget or scope, scope change on a particular project. So different from most processes completed in OLGA, change requests uh, are submitted to DRPC program managers and not directly through OLGA. We do want to emphasize that a scope change may be allowed if the requested change does not materially alter the original intent of the project. Examples of this include increasing or decreasing the quantity of something, like the number of units, when changing from hardware to software or vice versa, or when changing the revenue vehicle type. So an example of this would be changing from a 40-foot transit bus to a 29-foot transit bus. For merit scored and awarded projects, all changes for grants must be restored. For commuter assistance program, we ask that you follow the same process of first talking with your DRPT program manager so that they may assist you with the appropriate form. Remember, you cannot exceed the line item budget and total budget for this project. Please reach out to your DRPT PM well before a line item budget has been exceeded. And of note, failure to obtain pre-approval from your DRPC program manager for a line item budget transfer or exceeding a line item budget may result in a denial of reimbursements of additional expense for the line item. Scope changes may be allowed if the change does not materially alter the original intent of the project. All right, we will now get into de-obligating funds and closing out projects. So there are two ways to deobligate remaining funds for a project and close it out. The first way is to submit a final reimbursement request. These must be submitted at least 90 days after the final expenditure or project end date, whichever occurs first. It is your responsibility to double check with your contractor or vendor uh, to make sure that they provided you with their final reimbursable invoice. 
The second way is to submit a de-obligation request through OLGA. Uh, this is needed for all projects, yes, even those with a zero dollar balance. Okay, so we've reached a point in our presentation where we're gonna take a moment and see what questions you have thus far. We see any questions uh, pop up, Mary Olivia, any in the chat? I'm not seeing anything. Uh, as a reminder, please use the raise your hand function if you would like to be unmuted so you can ask your question or put it in the chat. A couple of questions just came in the chat. All right, the first question is, if we are not going to use funds this year, when do we need to deobligate by? I'm sorry, Mary Olivia, I had a little trouble hearing that question. Sure. Um, the first question is, if we are not going to use funds this year, when do we need to deobligate by? Oh, gotcha. OK, yeah, thanks for the question. So um, with projects that, again, have um, you have received your final uh, reimbursement and there's no other, um, excuse me, your final invoice from um, uh, the work being performed, um, as, as long as you've received that and can confirm and you know that the project um, expiration date has passed and it is past the window, as we talked about earlier, to um, that uh, uh, when you're not allowed to submit reimbursement requests any further, um, you can go ahead at that point and ask for the fee obligation. And that's something the DRPT program manager may also reach out to you about um, to try to get the obligated for you. Okay, and the second question is, um, can you give examples of indirect rate documentation? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to actually pause. I'm going to that and pivot to one of my colleagues here. Go ahead. Yeah, so Avi, so this is Chris Ravi. I'm the manager of statewide commuter programs for DRPT, so I can take this question. Um, so if you're charging an indirect amount on your reimbursement, obviously that was calculated somehow, right? It was either using the approved percentage uh, based on some some uh, uh, existing, you know, direct costs um, applied. So somehow that's that's calculated. So we just we want to see within that reimbursement how that was calculated. It could just be a simple formula where you per said we took these expenses and applied this percentage, um, and that's the percentage that we are approved and we, and we provided DRPT with that official approval letter. Um, or if there's some other way of doing it that you guys do it, um, you know, you may need to talk to your finance person on how that is actually calculated. Sometimes it's programmed in a system, but somehow behind that is a is a calculation. So that's just what we want to see uh, with the reimbursement so we can verify that the right approved rate is being used and we understand exactly how that that amount being charged is calculated. OK, the next question is when you deobligate funds, can you add the amount to another upcoming grant for the new year? Um. Yep, I can take that one. The answer with that is no. Um, the reason for that is, um, well, several things, but it may actually um, uh, cause um, sort of a, when these projects are actually awarded, they go through with what we call our merit scoring process. And um, if we were to take funds from an existing project and apply it to a future one, it could mess up the, um, the merit scoring process itself, and that's very specific and formula driven. Um, so the answer with that is no. I am not seeing any other questions at this time. OK, well, remember, there'll also be more opportunities in the presentation. We're going to take several pause breaks and as well as the at the end of today's presentation. 
So if you have a burning question that you have not asked, you'll have other opportunities later on. Okay. All right, well, next up in the presentation is asset management. We will get into asset inventory, vehicle disposal, and performance data. Okay, asset inventory is one of the primary functions within the Trans Am system. It is crucial to make sure that asset inventory has been updated. Uh, this is because we rely very heavily on this data for award decisions, as I talked about previously, through our merit scoring process, which prioritizes projects based on Trans Am data. It updates from a excuse me, updates from agencies are expected to occur, remember, twice per year, once on January 15th and again on July 15th. Asset profiles in the system include age, condition, and mileage. In addition to these profiles, this data also includes life cycle events on the asset, which include in-service dates, out-of-service dates, and when an asset has been disposed. In the past, there have been grantees who have missed out on funding because they did not keep their transit inventory updated. All right, so another important function of the Trans Am system is vehicle disposals. So for vehicles funded using 5311 funds, DRPT maintains vehicle titles for the duration of the vehicle's useful life. When a vehicle has reached the end of its useful life, agencies may request that the title and the lien be released. So to do this, you will need to send DRPT a written request to have the title be released so that the vehicle may be sold and or otherwise disposed the title will then be released once we can verify that the vehicle has indeed reached the end of its useful life. So for vehicles that have a fair market value greater than $5,000, the subrecipient will be able to keep a portion of the fund. So what recipients can keep is $5,000 plus the percentage of its local share above $5,000. Then the remaining federal share must be returned to the FCA. Okay, if you have a 5311 vehicle that is not needed any longer for the original intended purpose and the vehicle is not past its useful life, DRPT will work with you to have the vehicle transferred to another eligible subrecipient. Transit agency transferring their vehicle to another will be reimbursed for local interest of the fair market value of the vehicle by the new owner. In the rare case where DRPT is unable to find an eligible subrecipient for the vehicle, so long as DRPT and the FCA both agree with this, the vehicle can be sold by the original subrecipient. So remember that if you dispose of equipment before the end of its useful life, it does require prior, prior approval by DRPT. We will then notify the FCA of all vehicle disposals by subrecipient. All right, now we will get into performance data and asset management. So anyone who receives operating assistance funding from DRPT is required to submit ridership numbers officially referred to as unlinked passenger trips. Also vehicle revenue hours, vehicle revenue miles in Olga. Uh, and this needs to be done on or before the last business day of each month for the previous month's activity. So for an example, the deadline to submit July's data is gonna be the last business day in August. And so for this year, that would be Thursday, August 31st. For the subrecipients who are required to submit annual passenger miles traveled in Olga, please make sure to do this on or before December 15th annually. Performance metrics need to be entered into Olga by mode. One more note with this, performance, uh, monthly performance metrics are posted on DRPT's open data portal. And through this portal, uh, the data you submit is now public, so please make sure uh, to submit this information to, to us on time. Grantees also must attach uh, backup documentation that supports, supports each metric being reported. Olga will query the previous year's data and will flag variances of 10% or higher. If a variance has been identified, the grantee must describe the reason for the variance prior to data submission. Grantees may amend previously submitted performance data in OLGA if errors are discovered. And very soon, grantees will hear from their DRPT program managers to verify FY23 data. DRPT does ask uh, transit agencies to please complete performance data amendments in OLGA no later than October 1st for the previous fiscal year. So an example, State Fiscal Year 23 amendments are due no later than October 1st, 2023. 
And backup documentation should, at a minimum, include daily detail by mode and in a format that can easily be reconciled by DRPC staff. Summary tables uh, generated by Fairbox or APC will be accepted. Um, performance data amendments submitted after October 1st will not be reflected in DRPC's transit operating assistance allocation. And I do want to point out this slide uh, shows the top finding in DRPC compliance review. So as you can see by a wide margin, the top findings are that of performance data not properly supported. And then of course, the second most common finding are issues pertaining to vehicle inventory. All right, we will now cover commuter assistance program performance data. So for our commuter assistance program, known as CAP, we require recipients to submit the following monthly, new ride share attempts and new ride share matches, successful follow-ups made by phone, text, or email, number of active commuters in the ride match database, new guaranteed emergency ride home registrants, and lastly, guaranteed emergency ride home trips taken. It is important that agencies report their ride match data to their DRPC program manager monthly for verification. And a reminder that CAP operating performance has to be entered into OLGA on or before that last business day of each month for the previous month's activity. So please, again, refer to the DRPC Purple Book or get in touch with your friendly program manager for further assistance on this. And for commuter assistance program recipients of an employer trip reduction project, you will need to submit several items monthly here too. These include the number of employer sales meetings, the number of new and total level one through four employers, number of employers offering a pre-tax and direct tax benefit, and number of employers offering a pre-tax and direct band pool benefit. Recipients here need to provide a report from their employer database that verifies the submitted data. And a reminder that employer trip reduction project performance data must be submitted to your DRPC program manager on or before, again, the last business day of each month for the previous month's activity. Again, you're going to probably hear a theme here, but please refer to the DRPC Purple Book or get in touch with your PM for further assistance on this. And finishing up with commuter assistance performance data, uh, it is um, going to be CAP band pool project data. So please make sure to submit the following with this monthly. Uh, new and total van pools, van pool ridership, van pool revenue miles, and van pool passenger miles. And remember here, all van pool performance data must be submitted to your GRPC program manager, again, by the end of the month for the previous month's activity. All right, we have reached another point of the presentation where we're going to pause and take any questions from participants. I'm going to turn it over to Mary Olivia. Okay, looks like we have a question in the chat and one hand raised. I'll do the chat first. Um, for 5311 vehicles being disposed, when you say local share, does that mean the local match when the vehicle was originally purchased? Sorry, I had to come off of mute there. Um, is the, the question is, um, is the local share when that was mentioned, is that considered to be the original amount that was paid by the locality? Was that the question? Uh, yes, does that mean local share? Does that mean the local match when the vehicle was originally purchased? Yes. Okay, um, not seeing the hand raised anymore. We have more questions in the chat. Um, next one is, um, when will the state delete files from Trans Am that have been disposed? I'm going to kick that over to my colleague, Dan Sonnenklar. Uh, you want to take that, Dan? I know you're in Trans Am quite a bit. Yeah, I'm happy to take it. I only heard the second half of the question. Unfortunately, it's breaking up. Can you can you please repeat that? Absolutely. Um, when will the state delete files from Trans Am that have been disposed? 
OK, so um, the state doesn't actually delete any records in Transam. Um, rather, the entry moves from in service or spare or out of service into the status of disposed. Um, so that that uh, noting it as disposed uh, just uh, kind of turns it off from the active um, uh, fleet list. Now, I am not certain if you all can still see disposed vehicles. I know we can. Um, and so uh, I guess um, I'd be happy to expand upon that if there was more information that was needed. OK, um, the person whose hand was raised has now been lowered again, but you should be everyone should be able to unmute themselves to answer once they've been called on. So um, if that person who had their hand raised wants to raise their hand again. OK, Joe, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, good morning. Uh, my question is, I um, I'm a regional coordinator for, uh, you know, a commuter assistance program cap ride solutions. And um, does the van pool reporting apply to us? I know that obviously the cap reporting does, but we don't directly operate van pools uh, uh, commute with enterprise does. So this is Chris Raby. I'll take that question. Um, Hi, Chris. So, hey, Joe. Um, yeah, good question. So uh, yeah, you you don't have to worry about uh, reporting on van pooling. So that right now there's only three agencies that have to report on van pooling. And then I'll answer Andrea's question about van pooling also. Uh, yes, Enterprise, who's under contract uh, with DRPT, will report their van pools directly to us. So you don't have to do a thing. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, I don't see any other questions at this time. OK, well, again, uh, there'll be some other opportunities later in the presentation if you um, can think of a question at that point. All right, well, thank you. Um, we are now entering the section of the presentation where we're going to discuss transit strategic plans, also known as TSP, and transit development plans, also known as TDP. So the purpose of transit strategic plans or transit development plans are really to ensure that services are planned in a way that meets the mobility needs of communities throughout the state. These give us the give agencies an opportunity to evaluate and update services and networks and respond to changes in demand. So the primary goal of TSPs are really to create a strategic blueprint outlining desired changes that can improve the provision of transit services throughout each agency service area within, of course, existing funding structures. So a significant change for this fiscal year is that the TSP and TDP annual updates include what is now gonna be a joint quarterly meeting with DRPT planning and transit staff. So this will replace the previous commission method of a letter from each transit agency by January 20th. So now these updates will consist of a joint quarterly meeting in coordination with the transit agency's program manager and the designated uh, DRPT planner. The information typically generated in the annual update letter will now be obtained through discussion and review, and this can really help to ensure a timely delivery of the annual update ahead of the grant application cycle. A little more on this, these joint quarterly meetings will involve a member again of the transit planning staff attending one quarterly meeting before the grant application period alongside your DRPT program manager. Uh, an Excel workbook has been developed to provide an outline of what updates are expected, which include EDP, CSP progress or changes, performance data, short-term needs, vehicle inventory within Transam, and ridership trends, and public transportation agency safety plans and transit asset management reporting. Okay, and also um, on top of that, other planning needs in this will, get, will include governance changes, fare changes, route studies, 
uh, new service facilities, services or facilities, and unforeseen fluctuations or events. For this upcoming grant cycle for fiscal year 25, DRPT will be requiring grantees planning on applying for major expansion capital projects to go through a pre-application process. But, so this is gonna be revising our current merit scoring process. Any grantees seeking a major expansion capital construction project will now go through a pre-application process. This will be for those grantees with capital construction projects costing $3 million or more. These types of projects include the construction of new facilities and infrastructure, enhancements or renovations to existing facilities and infrastructure, and the entire replacement of existing facilities. This is a new pre-application requirement and will only apply to major expansion capital construction projects, not merit or other major expansion projects such as vehicle expansion. The FY25 pre-application will be due December 1st, 2023, and will need to be submitted to the dedicated email address, which is merit at drpt.virginia.gov. The regular full application will remain having the due date of February 1st, 2024. The major expansion pre-application will include the following elements, project name, applicant staff contact info, a detailed description of the project, a design sketch or site layout, which identifies the key elements or major features of the project, a cost summary, the total cost, and the anticipated state cost breakdown. Lastly, a readiness checklist to illustrate that the major expansion capital construction projects you are applying for indeed are ready for funded, funding. Excuse me. And links to our FY25 major expansion pre-application form and its guidelines for capital construction projects are available on this uh, handout webinar. And for any questions you may have on this new requirement, please contact your DRPT program manager or my colleague, Daniel Sonnenklar at the DRPT Richmond office at daniel.sonnenklar at drpt.virginia.gov. All right, so that was a lot to throw at you with new stuff. We're gonna now take a, a moment and pause for any questions you may have. Greeny, you may unmute and ask your question. Unmuting. Okay, good morning. My question is, Avery, um, you talked about the deobligation, this was earlier back on deobligating funds, and you showed um, uh, uh, a slide where there was an arrow where you could check that it was um, the final um, invoice. Does that mean that it's deobligated or you still have to go in and do the deobligation process? Yeah, good morning, Queenie, and thanks for your question. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I understand what you're asking. Um, so this, you will need to go in and check this um, to make sure that your um, your project has been closed out. So um, again, the, the caveat with that, even projects that have a zero fund balance still need to be the obligation. Okay. So to do that, you will go in um, shown on that, on that slide um, to do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Other questions? There are no other questions at this time, as far as I can tell. Okay. Well, we will move forward. And now let's get into some procurement updates, including GPC contract updates, prompt payment requirements, and state bus and rolling stock contract updates. Okay, so we have a brand new general planning contract or GPC. The bench of consultants will be made available for the next three years. Uh, prime contractors for our GPC are AECOM Technical Services, Michael Baker International Incorporated, Kimley Horn and Associates Incorporated, WSP USA Incorporated, 
and Rummel, Clef, Klepper, and Call LLP are also known as RK and K. And these prime contractors have many agreements with subcontractors, which are highly skilled in a lot of different areas like transit safety, GIS, transit bus system redesigns, fleet conversions, et cetera. And this contract, I uh, just want to point out, is available to DRPT and all transit agencies, MPOs, and human service agencies, as well as commuter assistance operators here in Virginia. Okay, it is not allowed to issue POs directly to GPC subcontractors. So agencies who wish to take advantage of the GPC contract need to first issue a purchase order to one of the primes before accessing the subcontractor. Even if your full intent is to work directly with this subcontractor, you must first go through the prime. FCA 49 CFR 26.29, the mouthful, states that prime contractors must pay subcontractors for the satisfactory performance of their contract no later than 30 days from the receipt of each payment from the grantee to the prime contractor. So this will apply equally to DBE and non-DBE subcontractors. If you are using DRPT's prime contractor, this stipulates, this stipulation rather, is a required part of the contract. And grantees who are using one of DRPT's prime contractors need to make sure to comply with this requirement and most importantly, document the prompt payment of subcontractors. Documentation of prompt payment within 30 days is highly critical here for compliance. 5311 grantees must document all subcontractor payments. And uh, when working with subcontractors, please work closely again with your DRPT program manager. Okay, uh, state bus contract update. Uh, we do have, I uh, wanted to point out several uh, uh, bus types that we and vehicles that we do have on uh, contract currently. And those are um, 11 passenger to 27 passenger body on chassis paratransit buses. Uh, actually, the 11 passenger uh, to 27 is a, a newer um, solicitation that's um, currently pending final review and award by DGS but we do still currently have a body on chassis contract. Uh, but we do anticipate with this one moving forward uh, with an award very soon, and uh, these vehicles, including the, the narrow body 11 passenger, will be available on state contract, um, which also will include options for gas, CNG, uh, diesel, hybrid, and propane. And we also have currently have a state contract for 12-year low floor transit buses, which have commuter coach bus options um, from size, in heavy duty from size 29-foot transit buses all the way to articulated buses uh, with options for battery electric, CNG, hybrid, and diesel. Uh, and also on the state contract are low floor body on chassis that include options for gas and battery electric. Modified minivans are also still currently available on the state contract. And lastly, Raised roof bands are on our state contract, which include options for battery electric. Okay, we're, we have reached yet another moment to pause for any questions you may have. Mary Olivia. Once again, please raise your hand or put your question in the chat. Avery, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Oh, there's one now. Um, so is the state contract now complete for all vehicles? Uh, yeah, I, I think this may be from, from Melanie with District 3. Um, I, I define all vehicles. There are a lot of different types. Um, we wanted to make sure uh, when um, making these contracts and actually working with uh, very closely with the Department of General Services to um, give a, a pretty wide range of vehicle types. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding your question fully, but um, if you're you're talking about maybe support vehicles, oh, small BOCs, I see in the chat. Um, so yeah, um, yes. So all of the ones that I mentioned are currently active um, vehicles that you can purchase. And there's also several options that you may um, explore as well. 
that were permitted in the contract? I hope that answers that question. And there, uh, there's a follow-up that says, thank you. I think some of us were waiting to see if certain vehicles we were looking at were going to be on the contract. Yeah, and thanks for pointing that out. I do want to just mention with that, if, if you find that there are, um, uh, you know, a, a certain need with your transit system um, for a specific vehicle type, please, uh, please talk to your, your PM, your program manager on that, or reach out to one of us. Uh, not to say that we, um, it may be something that we could explore um, in, in terms of future solicitations. If there's a type that's not currently included or, um, you know, perhaps something else for us to look at, um, that's, we, we certainly want to hear that feedback. So thank you for that. All right, well, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, again, there's going to be another opportunity, I believe one last opportunity before we wrap up today um, towards the end for some questions. Unless you see any others uh, currently, Mary Olivia. Okay. All right, well, let's go ahead and move forward. So let's get into communication updates, including policy and communication staff, and ways that the comms team here at DRPT can lend assistance. So our communications team here at DRPT consists of Andy Wright, who is our Chief of External Affairs and Strategic Initiatives. Andy oversees the team, including Miriam Foster, who is our Senior Creative and Marketing Specialist, Amy Friedenberger, who is the RPT's Manager of External Affairs, Suzanne Ellison, who serves as our Special Advisor and Legal Operations Specialist, and our very own Mary Olivia Rentner, who is joining us today and facilitating wonderfully on our, our webinar this morning, who is our Senior Communications and Legislative Specialist. It's our communication team's primary purpose to help tell the story of what you, our partners, do in the Commonwealth to improve people's lives through public transportation every day. They are very eager to help in any way that they can, whether it be with assisting in drafting press releases or issuing joint releases. And they also can help with creating social media content or sharing posts, planning public events, collecting and producing photography. Uh, if, if you'd like to solicit the help of the RPT communications team, we did want to emphasize, uh, please take advantage of this and please contact Andy Wright for additional assistance. And important to, important to point out uh, who is on our new communications and marketing contract. These are Sedell Communications, LLC, Pulsar Advertising Incorporated, Charles Ryan Associates, the Hatcher Group Incorporated, and PRR Incorporated. Your agency can utilize these bench contractors for your marketing and communication needs, and the listing of these firms and some basic information about how to utilize the bench will be posted on the DRPT website shortly. And you uh, also can always contact the DRPT program manager for this. Okay, so one of our final topics for today's presentation uh, are engineering updates focusing on construction project planning. I thought it was a cell phone. <laughs> no. It was just live. Feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So our wonderful engineering team here at DRPT consists of Alan Saunders, who manages our statewide engineering program and is based here in our Richmond office. Alan has been traveling statewide, assisting with progression of projects from feasibility to construction, and, uh, and, and has also been working very closely with DGS and VDOT to streamline transit shelter policies and procedures to support the goals of each transit agency. And we also have Bethel Kefilu, who supports the RPC's Northern Virginia office in Alexandria. She's joined, she joined our team in 2022 and does a lot to support many of Virginia's largest transit uh, facilities, uh, largest transit systems, uh, facility engineering and construction projects. She administers DRPT's GIS-based construction project program management portal, uh, is an accomplished project manager, smart scale guru, and is focusing on low and no emission infrastructure, including electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So focusing on transit sh shelters, if you plan to install a transit shelter, please let your program manager know so that they can connect you with Alan or Bethel here at DRPT, 
there is quite a process you need to follow. So one of the best uh, sources of information to first examine would be using VDOT's Land Use Permit Regulations Appendix 13. Please know that shelters on VDOT right-of-way must be approved. Uh, so the process for this includes the Virginia Department of Transportation, or VDOT, approving the conceptual plan. Next, the Virginia Art and Architectural Review Board, or AARB, must then sign off on the plans. The process then will shift back to VDOT at their local residency office to issue the land use permit. And then after that, it continues through VDOT's central office with their Capital Outlay Facilities Management Division. Then it will need to go through the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, review process, the State Environmental Review Process, or SERP, and the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, or DHR. So please know that our engineering team here at DRPT is an extremely valuable resource for you to assist with a variety of aspects, including facility planning like administration, operations and maintenance, transit hubs and facilities, transit stops, shelters and amenities, electric vehicle infrastructure, and light passenger rail. So going a bit deeper with planning and support, our engineering team can assist you with facility useful life, construction project planning and feasibility, project development and delivery methods, cost estimates and schedules, value engineering, lead sustainability, and project and construction management. Okay, and with that, we've reached our final questions break for today's presentation. So if there are any burning questions that you have about any of the, con the content discussed today, now would be your time to ask. Olivia. We have two questions in the chat. Um, the first is, can we provide a link to the vehicle contract? Um, yes, absolutely. And then the other, which was answered by Bethel, was, can you share the transit shelter information web page? That link is now in the chat. Um, Real quick, Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt you before I, yeah. I um, move on to that. So also want to just point out that the um, all the vehicle tr um, contracts can be accessed um, through EVA. So um, EVA's uh, portal, online portal, has changed a little bit if you're, if you're very familiar with it and have been in it recently. Um, so there are a few new uh, steps to get to it, but um, it is still accessible through EVA. Um, but we can also um, uh, work to try to see where we can... Uh, provide you that information too. So, thank you. Go ahead. The next question is, is the planning support through a grant process or something transit agencies can use um, without additional cost? I think I am going to pitch that to Grant. Um, if you could take that question. And just, just so I'm clear about this, <clears throat> this question, um, I'll, I'll just read it again. Um, is the planning, is the planning support through a grant process for something that transit agent agencies can use without additional cost? Um, so if we're referring to the um, general planning contract, um, that is something that is available to all of our grantees at no cost. Um, um, now, of course, they have to have some sort of funding to issue a PO to um, primes to do the work, and more often than not, that we're, uh, that uh, comes in the form of a grant from DRPT um, or grant writing assistance. Um, and I'm not sure what if this is uh, where um, where this question was going, but DRPT is available. Um, to assist with any sort of federal discretionary grant writing, um, and that usually comes from our planning team, um, and that is also available at no uh, no cost to you. The next question is: Can engineering assist with lead certification? 
So I'm, I'm not sure if uh, my colleagues, Bethel or Alan are on, but um, um, it is something that we can assist with. Um, I do know that usually this would be through, um, you know, the engineering uh, bench. Um, but if uh, either Bethel or Alan are online, if they want, if you wanted to add anything else with that. But yes, it is something that um, that we can assist you with in getting you some resources. The next question is one that I can answer. Um, it says, when will the YouTube recording of this presentation be posted? Um, earliest will be end of the day today. Um, latest will be Monday and there will be uh, an email that will go out um, with, again, the meeting materials and the recording. Um, so you can have all of that in one spot in your inbox. Okay, not seeing any additional questions. Okay, so we will now begin to wrap up today's presentation. So a few reminders, we do want to take a moment to just um, make sure that everybody knows that September 9th will be our 5310 Human Services Post Award Grantee Webinar. September 30th is going to be the final day to submit reimbursements for grants that ended on June 30th, 2023. December 1st is the deadline for the pre-application for major capital expansion applications. And also on December 1st, our fiscal year 25 grant applications will open. And then later this fall, we did want to put out that we will be hosting the fiscal year 25 grant application workshop. So more details will be forthcoming on this soon. And lastly, on February 1st, 2024, FY25 grant applications are due for transit and commuter assistance programs. If you have not already downloaded and read the Purple Book, we do want to just encourage you to do that. It's packed full of very valuable information that can really often provide answers to your questions that you encounter. Uh, and again, do encourage you to take full advantage of, of this um, for guidance with the RPT Grant Administration. Uh, just a reminder, again, that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on DRPT's YouTube page for reference. And should you have any additional questions that maybe you didn't ask today or think about later, um, about it, or really about anything that was discussed today, we do encourage you to reach out to your DRPT program manager uh, so we can find those answers for you. And with that, we have reached the end of today's presentation. We just want to sincerely thank all of you for your active participation and great questions. Have a great day, everybody.